Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, before we get started with our town hall briefing, we have a brief message for our Spanish speaking viewers to let them know that a translated version of this broadcast is being streamed live on YouTube. Silvia? Sí, buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión comunitaria sobre la recuperación del incendio Glass y el reingreso a las zonas afectadas. Esta actualización se estará transmitiendo en vivo por nuestro canal de YouTube con interpretación al español. Para escuchar la versión en español, puede usar el link de YouTube que se incluyó en la descripción de esta publicación en Facebook. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and thank you all again for joining us for our special town hall news briefing by the County of Sonoma, the City of Santa Rosa, and CAL FIRE. I'm Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County of Sonoma, and this is our update for Wednesday, October 7th. Our agenda for this evening is a little different than previous briefings. We will begin as usual with updates on the status of the glass fire and on the up the status on repopulation. But after that, our focus will be primarily on reentry and recovery, giving those who have suffered loss an idea of the resources available to them and the people who will be standing by them, by them on their road to recovery. But our primary goal is to answer your questions, whether it concerns the process of filling in and out an insurance claim or finding the status of damage to our local parks and our community as a whole. We have a full lineup of individuals from the city, county, and state available tonight to help you an get answers that you need. And you can do that. You can um, pose your questions either by emailing them to us at publicaffairs at sonoma-county.org. That's publicaffairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org, or by leaving your question in the comments area of the Facebook Live page um, in that comments area. Uh, and we have staff uh, standing by to help uh, gather all those questions and um, feed them to me. But first, let's get an update on the glass fire. And we'll go to our CAL FIRE Incident uh, Public Information Officer Chief, Jonathan Cox. Jonathan? Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jonathan Cox. I'm the Deputy Chief for CAL FIRE, as well as the Information Officer here on the glass incident. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a statewide perspective, some good news, we're down to 22 major fires. We didn't think we'd be saying 22 would be a, a good piece of news, but it, we're, we're trending in the right direction uh, in going down. Um, and uh, since August 15th, we can confirm over 3.7 million acres of California has burned uh, in a fairly short amount of time, bringing the yearly total up over uh, 4 million now. We have over 16,500 firefighters across the state still deployed, uh, along with 103 aircraft. Here on the uh, glass fire uh, specifically, uh, we've started the demobilization of some of our resources from the more outlying parts of California, uh, and we're down to 2,522 firefighters on the line. Uh, with that, a couple of the factors we're contending with right now is the weather is becoming more favorable over the next few days. Uh, however, the rains that was forecasted are trending um, more and more less or more and more unlikely, uh, which is not good news for us, but the higher humidity uh, should help us. Um, we are looking further on than this weekend, another warming trend next week and um, some potential additional warm weather and, and lower RHs. Uh, here on the glass incident, CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3 continues to be in unified command um, with multiple agencies between the two counties. As of this morning, the incident sat, sits at 67,200 acres at 58% contained. Um, the next uh, informational update is about two hours away where we should see that increase on containment um, as well as uh, specific information between the two counties uh, regarding the uh, repopulations that took place today. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, it's hard to get say that uh, 22 fires is good news, but given where we've been this year, that is certainly progress. Let's go for more on the uh, glass fire. Let's go to... Uh, uh, Battalion Chief Ben Nichols. Ben. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so the update on the uh, fire line here specifically in Sonoma County today is the firefighting crews out there as long as well as our partners uh, with utility companies, uh, Transportation Public Works uh, and Caltrans are continuing to make safe those areas uh, inside the fire perimeter to get folks home. Can tell you that there's a lot of work being done on Calistoga Road, off of St. Helena Road, 
uh, and also Erland working back into those uh, more remote areas of our burn scar. Uh, over my shoulder here, you got a strike team from Washington State. There's another one off of my right side that you can't see, but uh, both those strike teams, as uh, Chief Cox indicated, uh, have have uh, helped us construct that critical line and helped us get the uh, fire contained, uh, and they are getting ready to head back to Washington tomorrow. So crews are making great progress out there, continuing to hunt out those hot spots uh, interior, well inside the perimeters of the fire, so we can get folks home just as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, for an update on where we are with uh, repopulation and some of our evacuation areas, let's go to Sergeant Juan Valencia of the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office. Hi, uh, Juan Valencia, the Sergeant, the PIO Sergeant at the Sheriff's Office. Thank you for having us uh, today. So right now we sit at uh, 1,097 uh, people that are under a warning, or excuse me, under an order 2,175 people that fall under a warning. Uh, we're still working closely with CAL FIRE and public utilities uh, to get those zones open back up, um, but it's a work in progress. It's time consuming and uh, they're up there working nonstop trying to get people back home. Uh, today, we did open additional zones, partial zones that were not in the affected area, the, in the burn area. Um, so we're still continuously working with CAL FIRE um, and other allied agencies to get people back home. We understand it's been over a week. People want to get back home. We still stand at eight arrests uh, for people that have entered into the uh, evacuation order area. Um, and we still continue to have deputies out there uh, patrolling the area, keeping your property safe uh, and the community safe. Um, I have nothing else to report. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, and let's go to Santa Rosa Police Chief Ray Navarro. Chief. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so we've had some really good news today. Uh, all remaining evacuation orders for the glass fire uh, within the city limits were downgraded to warnings this afternoon. Uh, and I'm, um, that also includes the uh, properties located within the city's uh, burned areas. Um, I'm also happy to uh, announce that all fire related road closures within the city have also been lifted. Uh, we currently have 900 or 9,687 residents within the city of Santa Rosa who are still under evacuation warning. Uh, as just a reminder, those warning areas are Calistoga North, Calistoga South slash Skyhawk, Melita, Pythian, Oakmont South and Oakmont North and Stonebridge. So it's basically everything uh, east of Calistoga um, uh, in the city limits. If you uh, are a resident uh, returning to or visiting property uh, it, within those areas uh, of, that have been lifted, you should follow reentry and safety protocols. And so for more information uh, on what those protocols are, you can go to srcity.org forward slash glass fire recovery. If you don't need to be in those areas, we ask that you do stay off the roads. Uh, that will help assist your neighbors who are returning to their homes uh, or visiting their damaged or their destroyed properties. Uh, I'm happy to say we have not had any burglaries or looting incidents within the city's uh, evacuation zones over the last week. Um, and we will continue to provide uh, extra patrol uh, for community and property within these areas. Uh, we do ask the uh, property owners in these areas to do their best at securing their property as much as possible. Uh, if you uh, have not done so, we uh, do encourage the community to continue signing up for Nixel alerts. And you can do that by texting your zip code at or to 888-777. And I think that is all I have to report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. The uh, lifting of those evacuation orders was certainly good news. That went out about three o'clock this afternoon. And um, I know there's a lot of grateful people today to be able to get back. Um, uh, speaking of grateful, we're happy to have our uh, two uh, federal representatives, our congressional representatives with us today um, to talk about uh, the, our, our perspective from, the, from Washington. Um, Congressman Mike Thompson, let's start with you. Paul, thank you very much. 
Uh, well, the, the federal government has already uh, uh, provided for a 75% uh, match on the fire management uh, uh, grant funds that will go to help uh, pay for fighting uh, this fire. Uh, what we're waiting for, what uh, Congressman Huffman and I are waiting for right now is the state's uh, request to the federal government for a uh, disaster declaration. Uh, once that happens, uh, we will, well, we've already started. We already have all of the paperwork uh, drafted at our end. Uh, we will uh, we'll launch that paperwork and if approved, uh, there'll be grants available to homeowners and to businesses uh, that will uh, uh, provide for repairs or replacement of essential goods. There's also an unemployment, federal unemployment insurance uh, that is activated if this happens. And uh, there's also low interest loans uh, for uh, items that are not covered uh, by insurance. There's crisis counseling that will be covered uh, and there's legal assistance. And then there's also uh, a 75% federal match for any uh, debris removal uh, that has to occur. And uh, a reminder that, that uh, you don't get to collect from your insurance company on that and then get the federal government's help, uh, it is offset. Uh, and I just wanna caution everyone uh, there's no guarantee that a federal disaster declaration will be issued. And as of right now, it has not even been uh, requested. But uh, we're ready to go uh, if and when it should happen. And uh, we'll do everything in our power to help as much as we possibly can. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Congressman. And that, um, that is one of the questions we we're already getting from some of our viewers. So we appreciate you addressing that. We know that um, a lot of this is very complicated and people may not appreciate the extent of federal support until they get into the process and start to start the recovery phase. For more on that, let's go to Congressman Jared Huffman. Congressman Huffman. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Mike uh, did a great job describing the federal disaster relief that we're gonna fight for. Uh, and the, re the only reason we're waiting for some of these additional determinations is it's going to take a while to do the damage assessments. And so um, I, I know everyone's going to have to be patient and uh, we'll, we'll see if, if those meet the thresholds necessary to, uh, to establish the federal disaster. And if they do, we know what to do. Um, I, I'll just say this, Paul, um, we may be in the eighth or ninth inning of the fire fight part of this fire season. Um, and it's remarkable that as bad as this year has been, that frankly, some of the loss of life and damage was not worse when you think about the conditions and the overlapping crisis with COVID and the way our resources were stretched. Our firefighters and the whole team that we have had in Sonoma County working together on that firefight have done a remarkable job. But um, your community is going to be working for you after the fire is put out too. And for those who have lost homes and suffered damages and businesses that have suffered terrible impacts, um, we're going to be with you for the long haul. And so I do want to stress that. Uh, Mike and I will be working on the, the federal legislative side. Your local reps are going to be working with us to get federal relief and the state reps are going to be doing their usual heroic work. This community will support everyone through the grim task of cleaning up and recovering and rebuilding. And we will do what we can to get you back. So thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I think, I hope you're right in the sense we're in the ninth inning. I'm just hoping we don't go into extra innings on this fire season, yeah. but thank you very much. Um, for uh, more on uh, the, the local assistance that's available um, and uh, what, what people are experiencing, let's go to, uh, uh, Supervisor Susan Gorin, our chair of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Susan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you to the city and the county for working so well together with CAL FIRE. And a big thank you to our congressional representatives. With every disaster, we know we can count on you to be by our sides. And there are state elected officials as well. Uh, a meeting with FEMA tomorrow morning uh, who will begin uh, with the damage assessments. And uh, I know that the individual assistance from FEMA will be vitally important. So the first uh, suggestion I have for you is everyone save every receipt. 
because you may qualify for the individual and business assistance if in fact that declaration does occur and especially in the near future. But also you will need your receipts uh, if in fact you've suffered uh, damages, either a lost structure, home or damaged structure, save all of the receipts. Uh, the second advice I have for you is please avail yourself of the opportunity to go to the local assistance center this week at your earliest uh, possible uh, convenience. You will receive great information that we're just giving you a glimmer of, but you'll have an opportunity to talk with Permit Sonoma, the city of Santa Rosa, uh, United Policyholders and debris cleanup folks uh, and, and, and also Coffee Strong is there to give you some moral support. You can get through this. We will be by your side. And you know that um, I lost a home three years ago. I'm rebuilding now. Uh, we can do this together. And all of the damage in uh, Sonoma County occurred in the first district of my district, once again, please contact me, susan.goren at sonoma-county.org. We wanna reach you so that we can notify you of uh, future uh, meetings on social media or one-to-one -one conversations to help you through this. So please, my heartfelt sympathy goes out to all of you. Thank you for joining us this evening and the journey, the sad journey begins for you tonight. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. And uh, let's next hear from uh, Santa Rosa Mayor Tom Schwedhelm. Thank you, um, Paul. I have some additional information about the supply and support station and the local assistance centers. But first of all, we are grateful to all first responders, mutual aid agencies, and many, many city staff and county staff who've been working around the clock for 10 days now. Many of us, this is, I don't know which meeting this is, Paul, but 10 days in a row we've been working on this to ensure the safety of Santa Rosans and keep residents informed. Now that all evacuation orders have been lifted in Santa Rosa, our focus is on assisting the last of our residents to get back into their properties and on providing critical resources for those who are returning to burned areas and beginning the recovery process. We are mindful of how difficult it will be for residents who are returning to visit fire damage or destroyed properties. The city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma have set up supply and support stations to provide safety supplies and information, as well as support services to fire survivors during this difficult time. There are three station locations. Skyhawk Park at 5750 Mountain Hawk Drive, again, Sky Park at 5750, Mountain Hawk Drive, and that is open today until 7 p.m. and tomorrow, October 8th, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Another location is at Maria Creo High School, located at 6975 Montecito Boulevard in Santa Rosa, and that is also open until 7 o'clock tonight and then 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. through October 12th. And finally, in Sonoma Valley Regional Park, at 13630 Sonoma Highway in Glen Ellen. It also is open tonight at seven, until seven o'clock tonight and 10 a.m. through 7 p.m. through October 12th. A local assistance center or LAC has been established to provide assistance and recovery resources to all residents impacted by the glass fire. The LAC is located also at Maria Creo High School at 6975 Montecito Boulevard and is open 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day through Saturday, October 10th. Residents can get help with replacing documents and accessing information about financial resources, rebuilding, and insurance claims. Staff with the Santa Rosa Planning and Economic Development Department will be available at the LAC to help property owners understand the permitting process for recovery and rebuilding within city limits. Residents of the city of Santa Rosa may also contact our building department directly for assistance. Our building department officials are ready to assist you with specific questions about your fire impacted property. You may reach them at 
543-4649. Again, that's 543-4649 or by emailing rebuild at srcity.org. And then to keep Santa Rosa fire survivors informed about all of the steps in the recovery process, the city of Santa Rosa has established a glass fire recovery website. Chief Navarro mentioned it earlier. This webpage is located at srcity.org slash glass fire recovery. On this website, residents will find the city of Santa Rosa's property damage assessment map, tips to return home after a fire, including information about smoke damage, food safety, garbage service and electricity. Important information about the hazards of ash exposure and cleanup and updates on the debris removal process. Insurance resources are also, can also be located on the website. The city's recovery website will continue to evolve as more information and updates become available. Again, that webpage is located at srcity.org slash glass fire recovery. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so those are, we'll come back in a minute to more of the resources at the local level, but I now want to switch gears and talk about all the many resources that are available from our state officials, um, state agencies, and I can think of no better to, person to introduce to help talk about that than our state Senator, Mike McGuire. Senator? Hey, good evening, Mr. Goldson, and good evening to each of you, uh, Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors, Congressman Huffman, Congressman Thompson, thank you for your wonderful work on behalf of the county at the federal level. Uh, what we'd like to be able to uh, go over here tonight is an overview, an overview of debris cleanup. There are gonna be two different phases to debris cleanup that we that wanna make sure homeowners know about. Uh, it's gonna be advanced in coordination with the governor's office of the Office of Emergency Services. We'd like to be able to touch on the glass fire first. Then there is some new news about the Wallbridge fire on the second phase of debris cleanup. So tonight we have with us Ryan Burris. Ryan Burris is head of all debris cleanup for the state of California through the Office of Emergency Services. He is the uh, deputy director of recovery operations. He's gonna cover the two phases of debris cleanup tonight, focus on the glass fire. The first phase that will be initiated in the next couple to three weeks will be focused on household toxic debris. He's gonna define what that is and how that will roll out. He then will describe the second phase of debris cleanup for any homeowner who may have lost a home or has significant damage to a home. He will then describe the second phase of debris cleanup for those who lost homes in the Wallbridge fire. And the reason he's gonna do that tonight is uh, we have some late details of an agreement that has been worked out on the Wallbridge and thought it would be prudent to be able to advance here this evening. So without further ado, Mr. Golgson, we'd like to be able to turn it over to the Deputy Director of the California Office of Emergency Services, Ryan Burris. And I want to say thank you to Mr. Burris for all of his work uh, in this very challenging year. Mr. Burris. Thank you, Senator, as always. And thanks, everyone, for having me, uh, having me here today. Uh, and I do uh, just want to let everyone know that Cal OES will be here for you, not only for phase one and phase two, but we're going to be here uh, for you throughout this recovery, just like we always are in the past. And it, and, and, and like the previous comments, I hope there's not extra innings uh, this year. But for phase one, um, we are gonna be working with the Department of Toxic Substance Control to get this contract in place over, you know, over the next several weeks and get this cleaned up. That will include uh, cleaning up uh, things like propane, small propane tanks, your cleaning supplies, pesticides, batteries, and paint. This is critical for the first step of recovery. And we're uh, going to be actively pursuing this. Uh, phase two, and I'm going to go back to on phase one uh, for the for the other incident, we forecasted to take 60 days. We far exceeded that phase one uh, uh, for the Wabridge area, and we're looking forward to exceed any timelines uh, for for the glass fire. On phase two, that's the longer phase of cleanup. Uh, that will include your ash, your debris, asbestos, any sort of debris materials uh, that's that's on your property. And that's really gives you that sense of hope that you can start rebuilding. And that's where we all want to be, particularly as soon as we uh, uh, can. And we will be here throughout that process. The breaking news is literally three hours ago, we did work out an agreement with uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We got approval for uh, personal property debris removal. 
uh, which is a challenge to get. So we do want to thank our partners on the federal side for approving this. Uh, so phase two uh, will be starting uh, for that Wildbridge area soon. We'll, we just got the notice. So that will start the process of getting the contract on the street to get the contract awarded. And I'm confident uh, that this will be a fast process rolling out over the next few months. Uh, so with that, Senator, I just want to once again, thank you for all of your support uh, and uh, just let everyone in the, on, on the phone and Facebook know that well, I will personally be here and so will the team at Cal ES throughout this recovery. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much, Mr. Burris. Again, phase one will be rolling out in the next few weeks in the glass fire zone, focus on household toxic debris. And over the next few months, you'll see movement in the Wallbridge fire zone on the large cleanup uh, when it comes to those homes, unfortunately, that were uh, hit by the Wallbridge fire and burned down. Mr. Goldson, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, I know that we have representatives from the California Department of Insurance later on in the agenda, the Deputy Commissioner Cigarelli, who will be prepared to be able to cover all issues of insurance later on this evening. Thank you, Mr. Goldson. Thank you both very much. That is uh, very good news and um, we look forward to, to hearing more about it. So for uh, more on the, um, uh, the local assistance, let's go to um, uh, Deputy County Administrator, uh, Crystal Carajero um, from the Office of uh, Recovery and Resiliency. Resiliency. Crystal? Yes, good afternoon. Um... Mayor Schwell had covered a lot of the details, but one thing I'll say is that we really want to encourage people to come. Um, as much as it's helpful for them to get services, it's also helpful for them as they complete intake in forms coming in the door for us as the county and the city to understand what the needs are. Those, of course, are immediately shared with the state, and it's just kind of really helpful for us to hear um, what kind of services specifically um, are being you know, provided at the lab. Um, one thing, another thing too, I will say and encourage people is to absolutely um, respond to Supervisor Gorin's request to engage directly with block captain groups that I know she is setting up. That's proven to be a really great resources. And that is something I know she didn't mention, but they have a table set up to gather um, people who are interested in participating in that. Um, it's, it's really great support network, um, as well as just to get good information. So. Um, Apart from the state partners from Cal US who are there, we also have community organizations, active and disaster representatives to provide both um, support and information for um, not just for folks who lost their homes, but also who people who are in need of financial assistance. Um, the other thing I'll say, there are also mental health services providers through the county services. Um, and I'll just remind again of the county warm line and for people to go to the socoemergency.org site which is connected to recovery information for each of our disaster events. And I will just provide that warm line for mental health support is 707-565-2652. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Crystal. Yes, I appreciate you sharing that uh, warm line phone number. I know we also have um, uh, Lois Hopkins and John Kessel from the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Uh, Lois, do you have uh, a, a brief update for us? Um, sure. I just uh, want to, uh, I'm the coordinator for the Debris Task Force on behalf of the county. Uh, Kemplin Robbins at the City of Santa Rosa is our counterpart. Uh, the city and the county have a joint debris task force as we work through um, the process. Uh, as far as returning home, I think the most important information that we want to convey to people tonight is please wear personal protective equipment when you go back to your properties. Uh, the ash can be very hazardous and uh, breathing it. And so um, there is PPE equipment at the local assistance center. So we encourage everyone to please be careful as they go back to their properties. Um, I, Ryan Burris talked about the two phases of debris removal. Um, and the joint task force is working. We've put in the request to the state for a uh, public debris removal program for the glass fire for both phase one and phase two. And uh, we'll update everyone as soon as we hear anything back. Thank you. Great. And John Kessel, would you like to uh, uh, introduce yourself so people who know who's uh, in, your, in their corner? Ab absolutely. So uh, John Kessel and I work with the Watershed Task Force. I represent the county and the different departments there. Uh, we also have the city of Santa Rosa, 
uh, who are on that particular task force. We're a multi-agency task force. So we have um, all the different county agencies that might uh, be impacted by uh, watershed. So Sonoma uh, Water and um, Permit Sonoma, uh, Ag and Open Space, um, we've got regional parks. And then we have a multitude of state agencies. I just wanna say thank you so much for the state for all of their partnership. They always step up uh, with these watershed issues because they're so large. Um, you know, we really need the state assistance and they always are there for us. Uh, we look at both the hazards and also um, the mitigation. So it's really, we look at, at, at problems and solutions and more directly rainfall and then revegetation. So if you just think about it that way, that's, that's really what our mission is. Um, and I think another set of partners that I would really like to share with you, uh, we have some community-based organizations that are on our task force with us, um, groups like Sonoma, uh, RCD and Sonoma Ecology Center and others uh, who are really active um, and can provide great technical assistance. And, and we, we work closely with them and I uh, look forward to answering questions tonight. Great, thank you, John. Another, uh, uh, in addition to debris, debris removal, another big uh, question people have on their minds are, has to do with insurance. And, and on that front, we're very happy to have with us um, a Deputy in, uh, Commissioner Tony Signorali from the State Department of Insurance. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Thank you, Paul. And Insurance can be pretty complicated, whether you have a, a standing home with a partial loss with smoke damage or whether you have a complete loss, um, it gets pretty complicated. So the really key points that I'd like to bring home tonight are uh, go to the local assistance center in Santa Rosa. We have staff there through the duration, but if you're not comfortable going there or you're not able to make it there, please call us at our hotline 800-927 4357, or visit us online at insurance.ca.gov. There's a lot of information on our wildfire resource page, but you could also use our chat function and talk directly with one of our experts and ask them a simple question or really get into your, your case, the nitty gritty of your case. A couple of other points that I'll make. Um, we issued two notices in the last 30 days or so after these fires started. Commissioner Lara issued a notice in August requesting that insurance companies provide what we call expedited claims processing. So what does that mean? Uh, two of the main things that it means is we're asking insurance companies to provide 25% of your contents coverage if you have a total loss up front right off the bat to give you money so you can get out of a shelter if you're in a shelter or and move into semi-permanent or permanent uh, temporary housing while you're dealing with your claim. Uh, the other part of this is four, four months of additional living expense up front also. So those are two things that your insurance companies most of have already agreed to. Please contact your adjuster if you haven't already got that. And if you're running into a delay with that, please contact us so that we can uh, move that along and facilitate that, that advance payment just to get you going on, on your recovery. The second notice we issued was uh, a notice that we issued a couple days ago. Commissioner Lara is requesting that insurance companies pay 75% uh, and even up to 100% of your contents claim without the burdensome, uh, you know, uh, without the burden really of doing your inventory. Uh, you know, you have a, if you have a total loss and you have contents, your inventory could be 200, 300 pages long, and it could take hours and hours and hours to do. We don't think that's fair. We think insurance companies should pay you all or a significant portion of that contents coverage without having to go through that process. So that's the request we make. Several companies have already contacted us saying they were going to comply with that request to some degree or another. And over the next few weeks, we'll have better idea as to how all the insurance companies are going to do with regard to this request. Uh, a couple of other things. There's some new laws that went into effect after the 2017 wildfires um, in the legislature, we passed some new laws, some new protections that you need to be aware of. Um, the old law only gave you 24 months to 
get full replacement costs for your structure after a declared disaster. That has now been increased to 36 months plus extensions of six months at a time for good cause. So keep that in mind. You have, you're going to have a little bit more time than what the claimants in 2017 had. Uh, and for additional living expense, the same thing. It used to be 24 months with no extension for good cause. Now it's 24 months and up to 36 months if you have a good cause reason for that additional 12 months. So that'll help you out. But keep in mind that it doesn't increase your coverage limits for additional living expenses. It only increases the timeline. So make sure you budget yourself on your additional living expenses if you have a dollar limit for your additional living expense coverage. Lastly, I'll just mention that there are um, uh, a new, another law. The last law I'll mention is that you can now combine your structure coverage limit with your other structures coverage limit to rebuild your, your primary dwelling if you if you end up being underinsured. So in the past, you had to use your other structures limit only for other structures, and many people didn't, weren't even able to use all of that. So now the law allows you to take that bucket of money from your other structures coverage limit, such as garages and pools and that sort of thing, and use it for your primary structure if you're underinsured. So keep that in mind as you go forward. And, and the last thing, really, we're here for the duration, just like everybody else on this in this meeting. So please contact us at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end, whenever you run into a roadblock or a delay, or just have a question. Again, it's 800-927-4357. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, certainly knowing having that, that, that extra 36 months is going to be a relief for a number of people. I already hear some concerned about trying to find a contractor in an environment that's still, we have so much rebuilding going on from 2017. So that's uh, certainly a good reminder for people. Um, indeed, insurance can be a very complicated area. And for uh, uh, further um, information in that realm, uh, we invite M Amy Bach from the United Policyholders. She's a well-known uh, figure in Sonoma County and has helped many people in uh, through their insurance issues in the past. Amy, welcome. Uh, you want to give us an update on what you you provide? Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, <clears throat> this has all been excellent information. And um, while we're all sorry that we have to be here again, it's um, good to know that with each of each successive fire, um, things seem to get a little bit easier because we we figure out uh, you know there are so many people in your community that are available to help um, those of you who are now walking the same road to recovery that. Um, people have been walking in the area since 2017. Um, UP, United Policyholders, UP for short, we have something called the Roadmap to Recovery. It's a free program. Uh, we're a nonprofit and we've been offering this program after wildfires um, for almost 30 years. And we're, you know, just like uh, Commissioner of Insurance mentioned that insurance is complicated, um, we try to simplify it. And so a, a big part of the roadmap to recovery um, is to combine uh, people who've been there, done that, lost a home, uh, learned some lessons that they want to share, and then um, our technical expertise in insurance and all of our partners to bring to impacted households really basic guidance um, on how do you get from the ruins of your house or um, going back to um, a house after you've been evacuated and, and back to as close as possible where you were before the fire. Um, just a couple things I wanna hit on. Um, uh, our website, uphelp.org, U-P-H-E-L-P.org is, um, is, a, is a real go-to site for you. We have a library there, 2020 wild, California wildfires. Um, we are teaching a workshop. It's actually happening right now, um, but we're recording it. So you'll be able to watch it at your convenience. It's for partial loss or standing home folks. We are covering um, the basics on what do you, how do you figure out whether your air quality is safe? Um, can you rely if your insurance adjuster says it's safe? Um, is that, is there word enough? Um, and, or what, what can you do to, to uh, get the kind of expert assessment that will make you feel like it's safe for you and your family to be there? And then of course, um, figure out what has to be done to clean up the damage and restore your house. For those, that's tonight. Um, and if you miss it, of course, um, if you're on here, you're missing it, but um, we will be recording it. And the recordings are available for free at uphelp.org tomorrow night. Um, I will be leading a workshop, again, free, 
Um, this is the fourth in the series for 2020 wildfire survivors. They've all been recorded. You can watch them at your convenience. Very simple, uh, straight scoop news that you can use on your dwelling, the, what your insurance policy will give you um, for dwelling and how you should approach the process. Um, insurance is a vehicle to get you back where you were. Hopefully you have it. Um, many of you will find you don't have enough. Um, and our guidance is going to help you deal with what is, not how you wish it were, but how it is. If you don't have enough insurance, here's some options. Um, and if you and whatever insurance you have, here's how to make the best and get every dollar and navigate um, the system. Because um, as I'm sure you're all hearing from neighbors and friends, um, the insurance process is not as simple as it should be. Um, but people like, uh, you know, your, your uh, Senator McGuire and other elected officials that are on this briefing have been working very hard um, with the Department of Insurance, with my organization, um, to get these new laws into place to, to ease your path. And we've had a lot of success. So your path should, will not be easy, but it will be easier um, than it has been for, for previous people. So just um, stay you know, as calm as you can, take as much time as you can before making major decisions, especially in the first month when, when your mental um, state is not, you're not getting enough sleep and, and all that. So avoid making big decisions, resist pressure. Um, don't worry that if you don't hire somebody right now to start your rebuild, you, know, you won't be able to find somebody. There will be resources, there are, a, a, tremendous amount of resources available. So again, um, we're rooting for you. You are very much not alone. Um, uphelp.org and um, thank you so much, Paul, for being part of this, um, all this information. Well, thank you, Amy. We really appreciate you being here uh, tonight. Uh, before we get to uh, questions, um, we do, uh, we know that a number of people have questions about water safety, wells and septic. And to help us on that front, uh, we've invited Jennifer Burke, Director of Santa Rosa Water to be with us, and Nathan Quarles from Permit Sonoma. Jennifer, let's go to you. Do you have a, a brief uh, update in that area? Thank you, Paul, and thank you for inviting me here this evening. Uh, this information is for those that receive water supply from the city of Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa water system operators worked diligently and we closely monitored our water system throughout the glass fire. Santa Rosa Water's distribution system was not damaged or compromised during the glass fire, and we did not lose pressure in our water system. This means the city's water distribution system remained fully functioning during the fire and maintained pressure in the system, pre preventing contaminants from entering our water system. This is very different than what occurred during the 2017 Tubbs fire when the system lost pressure due to significant water loss. So I just wanna reiterate, in this fire, we did not lose pressure in our water system and the city's water system was not compromised. Ongoing samples show that the city's public water system meets all safe drinking water standards Based on lessons learned from our previous experience, as well as working with experts and our regulators, we've taken precautionary measures and continue to go above and beyond the minimum regulatory requirements for our water system. We are monitoring water quality and performing routine sampling throughout the entire city to ensure drinking water meets all safe drinking water standards. As an additional precaution in the fire impacted areas, we are flushing the water system and we have taken water quality samples from our reservoirs, sample stations, and hydrants. Results from these samples show no contamination in our drinking water supply or water mains. At properties that have been damaged by the fire, water system operators have removed each water meter and we have flushed each water service line. This is the line that goes from the main in the street to the water meter box at the property. By removing the water meter, this isolates the damaged properties from the community's water system. And we are taking water quality samples from these service lines. To date, all water quality samples that have been analyzed from water service lines to burn properties have met all drinking water standards. We wanna remind folks that 
properties that have been damaged by the glass fire will need to meet all water system standards and be deemed safe before we can reconnect them to the water system. And we're here to help. And as others from the city have mentioned, including Mayor Schwedhelm, you can visit our website, srcity.org slash glass fire recovery for information regarding the city's water system and how you will need to connect to the water system if that is something that will need to happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Nathan? Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Paul. So in the rural setting, water typically it comes from individual domestic wells. And what we found um, from other fires is the well itself generally remains intact and is still able to produce potable water. There may be uh, damage at the surface, like if you have a well house or the electrical going to the pump. Uh, these can be solved with a, a simple repair. We're asking for repair permits, uh, especially for the electrical components. Um, so on the septic side, uh, most septic systems, again, will receive superficial damage uh, a manhole may melt, a plastic valve may melt, things of that nature that can be done with a nominal repair permit as well. Um, I do wanna give a, a, a plug in for our permit center. So I know that's not an immediate concern, but um, before very long, people will be submitting designs or having structures uh, designed so that they can rebuild and get back into their homes. And unfortunately, due to the other fires, we, the county has established a resiliency permit center. Uh, the major goal of the permit center is to get folks, get their designs reviewed as quickly as possible and get a permit in hand so they can start redeveloping. And so that permit center is still active. Uh, if you Google Sonoma County RPC, the first result should be to the uh, permit center and there's a ton of information on how to do uh, rebuilding in um, to recover from the fire. So major highlights of that program are we have reduced fees for the fire survivors. We have a mandated or contractual turnaround time processing times of no more than five days. So our contractor will get you comments within a week uh, so that you can get a resubmittal and correct any any issues and get a permit issued. Um, so those are the two major highlights of the permit center. And we've been here since the 2017 fire. Um, oh, the other thing is, is in the vein of uh, working with everybody and being here, we are going to be asking the board of supervisors to revise the contract for our contractor in the RPC to extend time for these additional disasters. Uh, that's all I've got, Paul, thanks. Great. Nathan, I just want to thank all of you for your statements. Um, I know you, you kept it tight and we had, we covered a lot of material. I do, you did answer a lot of the questions that were, have already been posed, but we're going to go to some of the other questions um, that we have now. Um, but before we do, I want to go to um, Sylvia and ask her to do another reminder for our Spanish speaking listeners. Thank you, Sylvia. Sure. Yes. Buenas tardes. Si nos acaban de acompañar, esta reunión comunitaria está transmitida en español en vivo en nuestro canal de YouTube. Esta es una actualización de la recuperación del incendio Glass y el reingreso a las zonas afectadas. Para escuchar la versión en español, puede usar el link de YouTube que se incluyó en la descripción de esta publicación en Facebook. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And, and just a reminder that you can submit questions by emailing them to publicaffairs at sonoma-county.org or leaving them in the comments box on Facebook Live. The first question I'm going to go to um, really has to do with debris cleanup. Um, and while we have our, our, our state officials with us, the question is, will the government pay for phase two of the debris cleanup or will that be up to the residents to cover? Um, anybody want to take that one on? Paul, it's McGuire. I'm seeing if uh, Ryan Burris had a, another meeting in San, okay. Diego, or San Diego in Santa Cruz this evening on debris cleanup. Here's what I'll say on the issue of the glass fire. It's still to be determined. Uh, both FEMA as well as state office emergency service officials have been out this week uh, doing a significant survey of the damage related to the glass fire. 
Uh, we will have more to be able to report here in the next week or two, not trying to be coy, just being candid uh, that the damage assessments have just begun um, and we'll know more uh, about what will be covered and won't, what won't in the next week or two. So more to come on that. And again, I apologize, we don't have a firm uh, answer at this time on the glass file. No, we understand, Senator, thank you. And we will be sure to let people know as soon as we can, this is a long road and we will be with people all along the way. So on the question of the damage assessment, um, the, the, one of the questions is how soon will Sonoma County have the damage assessment of the glass fire complete? Uh, Chief Nichols, do you wanna take that one on? Uh, Paul, uh, as of this morning, uh, the damage inspection uh, information was 85% complete with a expected uh, 100% uh, by the end of the day or tomorrow. My understanding was the county was going to post that uh, this afternoon. Um, not sure if we've got a, a county rep from the EOC uh, or the Department of Emergency Management on the line. Um, I will, uh, uh, we will check on that and see if uh, that is going to, that may be going up tonight. We'll, we'll let you know, but, um, um, so we're 85% done and I know that, that there's work still going in that direction. Um, I, I do want to invite our media partners. If they have questions, they are, they're welcome to raise their hand and ask questions. Um, uh, let's go to the next question, which is, um, how will we know when the county will come to our property to clear hazardous debris? Does this need to, to happen before, before we remove debris? So um, ha the hazardous cleanup portion, I guess, is the question. Uh, yes, um, the, the phase one, the hazardous sweep will be conducted by the government. Uh, it's mandatory for all properties, and um, we will uh, notify people when we get the information um, of when the sweeps will begin. And yes, they, they phase two debris removal cannot begin, whether it's a government program or it's private, until the phase one is complete. Hey, and Paul, just to take, tag onto that, uh, there was some initial assessments that were done that allowed the repopulation. So both the county and the city both did those initial sweeps that come prior to the phase one and phase two that allow the repopulation to move forward. Uh, another assessment that was done on top of the CAL FIRE damage assessment teams uh, in the city of Santa Rosa was an assessment by our building inspectors. So city of Santa Rosa residents are able to go to the glass fire recovery website that was discussed earlier by the mayor and they'll actually be able to see uh, the status of the property and the assessment and not just from a damage or destroy, but also from a habitability standpoint, uh, specific for residential structures. This is Susan Gorin. Uh, please be care. Please access the supplies that you need in order to walk around your site. And please, please be careful if you're walking through the ashes. There are things hidden in the ashes: wires, electrical wires, plumbing. Um, shards of glass, shards of melted glass. You do not want to fall in those ashes and because they are hazardous in of themselves. Also, before you start walking through your site, photograph everything. Uh, your insurance company will be out there to photograph as well, but you will want to know what you see in your ashes that can remind you of what you lost but also note where your house sits and its location on your site so that you understand how to move forward uh, and be um, slow and deliberate. Take the time that you need. Thank you. Indeed, thank you, Supervisor. Thank you all. Um, and I am uh, uh, notified by the staff that the damage assessments that we were talking about recently, um, uh, we are putting the final touches on, on those and we will have them posted by tomorrow, by tomorrow morning. So that's, that's the plan at this point. Um, uh, Paul, if I could also add one yes, thing Lois. on the ASH. Um, there's information that uh, if um, property owners disturb the ash that they may uh, be ineligible for any public program. And I want to make it clear that by disturbing the ash, that is either 
enlarging the ash footprint or reducing it either by adding other debris or raking the ash. And so it's not going onto the property and looking for small objects um, you know, of, of what survived the fire. It's really a kind of major disturbing of the ash footprint. And I would add, uh, prepare yourself because not much has survived the heat of the fire. But if you are going to sift your ashes, uh, please be prepared with the, with the suits and the booties and the gloves that you need and definitely a mask and a hat. Bring some sifters, some fine grain sifters. Uh, but but um, again, take the time and I think you'll be really saddened to see there's not much left of the possessions that you prize so much. Paul, I believe there are charitable entities also that are available to help um, with the with the with the sifting if you just can't emotionally handle it, which I think for a lot of people is the better move. But taking a few pictures is is important. Those are all really good uh, tips. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question about the local assistance center. Um, as you know, there's a number of um, senior citizens. Um, from Oakmont and other places have been impacted by the fire, but they're also very concerned about COVID-19. Um, can you, uh, can we give people an idea of what steps are being taken for, uh, to ensure safety at the, the, the local assistance center? And they're also asking if there are resources offered um, virtually as opposed to going in person. Crystal, do you want to take some of that on? Or Susan? Can I, can I, can I just answer uh, the COVID precautions? Absolutely. We have folks uh, checking you out for your temperature, ensuring that you are wearing a mask. And we have plexiglass uh, barrier guards between the person at the back, at the rear of the desk, and you're facing with a little slot so that you can pass through papers. Uh, I will be there, my team will be there on and off this week. Uh, please know that we're trying to take every precaution to keep you safe and to keep us safe. Uh, but I can't answer the question about um, the virtual. I know that you could probably get information from any of the entities that might be physically present on the site. Certainly United Policyholders, wealth of information. And uh, let us know, uh, folks on this panel, if they can reach you virtually, if they don't want to go into the local assistance center. Thank you, Chair Gordon. And I'll also just say that we did have that instance of um, a friend of an elderly um, community member um, stand in line, complete the intake form. We noted that it was um, because somebody was elderly or concerned about health issues. However, that intake form was still shared with the community or the co-ed groups. Um, and as the chair said, there are most of the state agencies have some form of virtual services, um, as does the county. Permit Sonoma folks are there, but they have virtual services as well. The assessor's office, um, human services for CalFresh support. There are a lot of uh, virtual services available and those agencies and groups are listed on the SoCo Emergency org recovery resources page, but we are doing our best to accommodate understanding that not everybody is able, willing, you know, and concerned about their health, but also just to, for convenience sake. And I think um, the Department of Insurance has a toll free hotline that folks can call um, to ask questions and and as as Supervisor Gordon mentioned United policyholders. Um, all of our workshops, we're offering them virtually. Um, and for those who don't have digital access, we, we have this yellow disaster recovery handbook. And if you have any, uh, if you have a, if you're connected with a neighbor or who's a senior and you think they need a copy, um, info at uphelp.org will shoot it right out if we have a mailing address. And they are available at the local assistance center as well. And Paul, so I, I would add. I but, add one. Paul, oops, sorry, Mayor Schwedholm, you go first. Yeah. I was just going to say, for the city of Santa Rosa, as I mentioned earlier, we have building officials both at the LAC right next to Permit Sonoma, but you could also drop a dime on them at 707-543-4649, 543-4649, ask any question, or if you're more comfortable, just send it an email, send it to rebuild 
at srcity.org and we can get whatever information you need. I wanted Great. to I also wanted to add for seniors, we have an information and assistance line with human services specifically for seniors or caregivers. And that is a five day a week um, uh, assistance from nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night. Uh, those are social workers who work for us in our human services department. So uh, please share that with your friends or if you're a caregiver and you need some assistance, um, that's another good line to call. And I don't have it at my fingertips, Crystal. Maybe you, you have it, but it is on socoemergency.org. But if you can maybe pull it up before we finish, thanks. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Zane. We have uh, two questions about insurance. So I think I'll direct these to Amy and Tony, if, if you will. Um, the first is, if in, and this is from Jesus, it asks, if insurance is not covering temporary housing, are there other resources that are available? Um, um, I don't think there are any policies that would not cover temporary. So maybe this yeah. person have insurance or we can't tell. Yeah, maybe, maybe they don't have insurance. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And I'll just add that, you know, depending on if you have all, co all coverages on your homeowner's policy, you'll have a lot, what's called loss of use. And it could be in the additional living expense option, which is you turn in your receipts and, and every month you get, you get reimbursed. There's also a second option, fair rental value, which is the fair rental value of your home if it were rented out. That's another option that some companies have. If you have the fair plan, that's the only option you have. So you don't get what's called additional living expenses with the California fair plan. You will get what's called fair rental value. And so those are just a couple uh, ways to, that you would get your coverage, but every policy will have some form of coverage for temporary housing. Great, thank you. The other question has to do with, um, it, it reflects some of the growing, a lot of the growing concern people have about finding insurance after events like this. And we've had, uh, as you know, a number of major fires. So the question is, how will the state manage or how are they addressing the growing insurance scarcity issues for those um, within the fire zones and how will we be able to uh, obtain homeowner insurance in the future? Well, Al, go ahead, Jamie. So okay, I'm to uh, Tony, the, the Department of Insurance and United Policy Holders are working um, very closely to, to, to get um, the market back on track. Um, but the fair plan is always there. They take all comers. So, um, and, and, you know, the market is still, there are still companies that are selling. It's not a great situation. Um, again, uh, our website has, we, we did a, a, a webinar recently with shopping tips for um, in today's difficult market. Um, and the department has um, some tools as well. Um, again, it's just a matter of uh, if you're an agent or broker can't help you, um, you've got to find another agent or broker because there are options. You just have to, you have to it takes a lot more time and, and effort to find them than in the past. And some of them are not great. Uh, there's no question that we have some work to do to restore a competitive um, home insurance market in California. And, and uh, this, Tony, I'll just add that um, with regard to people that have a suffered a total loss, they're going to have two years of coverage. The insurance company is prohibited from non-renewing them for the next two years. So that'll give them time to make sure that they have coverage in place during that time. Um, also, in addition to that, we're going to be issuing a bulletin uh, based on a law that uh, then Senator Law, or now Commissioner Law, passed a couple years ago um, that's going to put a moratorium on non-renewals and cancellations for areas and zip codes around the wildfire perimeter, within the perimeter and adjacent to the perimeter. And so when we put that notice out, the insurance company will be prohibited from canceling or non-renewing for a year, even if you didn't suffer a loss. And so there will be that protection. It's not gonna last forever, but it will give you time to shop for coverage, also give the state and others time to hopefully figure out solutions to mitigate, you know, that problem that's that's down the road. Well, thank you. We know that's going to be a conversation we're going to be continuing to have um, throughout all of this. 
The next question is from uh, Jay. He wants to know uh, what is being done to protect watersheds? Can we get early toxic debris removal at Adobe Canyon at the headwaters of the Sonoma Creek? Um, not a lot of damage so far, but critical to water downstream. So, but in general, I guess the question is more to do with protecting watersheds. John, do you want to take that one on? Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, we're, we're very concerned about uh, protecting watersheds. That's what we do um, after these fires. And uh, we work really closely with our community-based organizations. I mentioned Sonoma Ecology Center, Sonoma RCD, Russian River Keeper, Community Soil Foundation. And so really the first step is to contact them with your property address and they'll come out and do a uh, field inspection and get a sense of what's going on from a technical perspective. And then from there, we can figure out what to do and how to, how to move forward. It's gonna be unique for every property. Um, I will say that oftentimes if the, if the property that's burned has a structure within uh, you know, 200 feet or so of a creek, uh, we really like to get a containment uh, set of waddles around the pad side on the downhill side like to get that established and um, that will be something that will ultimately get removed with the phase two uh, and is slightly different than sort of the landscape erosion control which we also work to, to do but two different kind of concepts there and uh, that's why that technical review is so important um, so reaching out to those partners uh, um, or you can you know contact us at the at the county and uh, we can put you in touch with those same partners. And, and we work closely together since 2017 on multiple fires, unfortunately. Um, same thing with Kincaid. And so uh, we're getting really well coordinated on that. Great, thank you, John. On that note, we also have a, a question about the state of our local parks, including um, Annadale and Sugarloaf. Um, uh, and uh, the question is, you know, how soon um, uh, we might be able to get back in uh, to those parks, even if they are burned. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Deputy Director of Sonoma County Regional Parks, Melanie Parker, is here with us. Melanie, you want to take that one on? Sure, Paul. Um, thanks for the question. I would say, you know, so I'm with Regional Parks, but we work in collaboration with State Parks, Team Sugarloaf, and Sonoma County Ag and Open Space, and all together we are uh, working with CAL FIRE at Incident Com Command to understand impacts to our parks. Uh, it's still pretty early to tell, but I would say right now what I can tell you is at Hood Mountain Regional Park, all 2,000 acres of the park has experienced some level of fire. It looks like the hotter uh, impacts have been on the Los Alamos and McCormick addition side, so that would be the north and the east sides of the park. At Sugarloaf, uh, part of the park, uh, uh, Roughly 50% is impacted of the 4,000 acres. And then just talking to Ag and Open Space partners tonight, they have about 5,000 acres of both open space preserve and uh, uh, conservation lands under easement that have been impacted by the fire. And for Annadale, I would look to my partner, Ben, to estimate acres. That was a slop fire that went into Annadale over the line. But you know, back of the envelope, I'm, I'm looking at maybe 12,000 acres of park open space and protected ag lands that were impacted by this fire. And uh, I just can't help myself but say once again, you know, parks and open spaces uh, really do give firefighters the opportunity to protect our communities. And we work with them before the fires, during the fires and after the fires to think that through. Um, in terms of buildings, we had some minor losses at Sugarloaf, of course, the Red Barn uh, was lost. At Regional Parks, our sign shop was lost. Um, the observatory at Sugarloaf is in good shape. I would say on our side, our ranger residences at, um, at Hood Mountain are okay. And I can talk more about longer term concerns, but to answer your question, Paul, we really estimate that uh, we're gonna be through the winter with those parks closed and looking at watershed integrity like John talked about and uh, really making sure that we've got the headwaters of Santa Rosa Creek and Sonoma Creek um, secure before we really have any robust public access. Great, thank you. That's certainly understood. Um, in terms of access, uh, Ben, I think we're gonna, we have a few questions about specifics about uh, certain areas. In particular, we've had a number of questions about how soon uh, 
uh, residents might have the evacuation orders might be lifted in the Los Alamos Road, Cougar Lane area. They're saying some some have insurance representatives are asking for access in order to evaluate damage. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, Paul, when I was up there uh, two days ago, um, there was uh, utility work being done on the Cougar Lane itself. Uh, when I was up there a couple of days before that, there were uh, power poles and trees across the road. So that work is ongoing. And as soon as we can get that roadway clear uh, and those utilities made safe, then we will get folks home just as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. It's hard to be patient sometimes. Um, so uh, another question we have has to do, we've, we've, we've had a lot of questions having to do with alerts and the warning standards. Um, I may turn to our supervisors who might have some thoughts on this, but um, I guess part one of the questions is, you know, how can, can we, we still need improvements on our alerts and warnings? I think we can all agree. And um, one of the questions is whether there might be some state legislative efforts coming to establish statewide alert warning standards. Um, uh, Susan Gorin, do you have some thoughts on that? I, I really think the questioner, and that is the question that I have, how are we doing? And who received an, award, an alert um, from either SoCo Alert or from Nixle? And I'm not sure that I've received either of those. Um, but we also had the coordination and the need for additional coordination between the city and the county uh, in the Sonoma Valley. So I'd like to um, maybe do a survey of trying to understand, did you receive an alert? If so, when? How much time did you have to evacuate? And what I'm discovering, especially from folks on St. Helena Road and Los Alamos, is that they had no time to receive an alert at all. Uh, the fire was there, they saw the glow, it was halfway up the ridge, it was at the top of the ridge and they were out of there. I am so grateful that we didn't lose anyone in the fire, but we did lose some pets and some livestock. Um, that fire came in very hot, very fast. Uh, and, but I also know that St. Helena Road and other areas uh, do not have the best cell service broadband. And that's another thing that we're going to have to work on and I have been working on, but it's challenging. So um, we're better than we were three years ago and we're not good enough. We'll work on it. It is, it is a, a work in progress and, and there's uh, many uh, many aspects to that issue. And I know you're going to be addressing that in the days to come. The other issue had to do with evacuations. And um, Lance makes the point, he said, my wife, Lee, spent about an hour and a half uh, trapped in Oakmont in her car, trapped in traffic. Um, how can we evacuate faster? Well, I would just say, uh, first of all, I was in the hour and a half traffic and had the same thoughts. And but I know that folks from Oakmont have been working with Paul and the city officials to open up another evacuation route. But um, Paul I, and Mayor, I would love to talk with you about, uh, OK, let's work on this. Another issue. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. We did learn a lot in 2017 and made some pretty significant improvements to how we acted and reacted uh, to this specific fire. I will tell you that uh, even before units were on scene of this fire, uh, the city of Santa Rosa was already in communication between our fire department, our emergency management and public information officer knowing the potential and basing that off of what we watched on the fire cameras. So we had actually already started uh, our communications plan uh, as units were still en route. And then based on the conditions that were reported by the first in fire units, we initiated our emergency communications plan, issued a NICSL, issued uh, multiple wireless emergency alerts uh, for both evacuation warnings and orders, and did that uh, hours in advance of uh, the fire potentially crossing into the city limits. Uh, 
the supervisor is correct. Uh, there was a lot of communications that took place uh, with residents in Oakmont. Uh, there were a number of residents that did not think uh, that we would be able to evacuate Oakmont uh, under conditions similar to what we experienced in 2017. And we agreed. And that was why we highlighted the importance of utilizing the network of cameras that we have now to initiate those systems, knowing very well that if we did decide to evacuate all of Oakmont, uh, essentially at once, that we would do it in a manner that we knew that there was the potential for them to be in traffic for an hour to two, but knowing that they would have an hour to two to get out of harm's way and allow us then to then freely move around not only Oakmont, but also Rincon Valley and Skyhawk. So from an alert and warning standpoint, uh, our success was measured by us being able to move around Oakmont freely by the time the fire got there without residents evacuating as well as in uh, Rincon Valley and Skyhawk. Uh, the firefighters, as well as law enforcement, being able to, to do that successfully this time, I really do think uh, played a, a significant role. And switching that back to the debris question, I think that's why we're actually struggling a little bit with some of the differences between this fire and 2017. In 17, it was very easy for the debris task force to determine whether or not the fire was eligible for the phase two debris removal program. In this particular incident, we're actually having trouble determining in advance whether or not a home is going to be eligible for phase two because it's not fully destroyed and it's not an ash footprint. So we're actually measuring that as even more success for um, a lot of what took place on this fire that you know, we don't want to see any homes destroyed, but the fact that we're actually having to look at and truly look at what's damaged versus destroyed in a phase two potential debris mission uh, is, is a good position to be in, believe it or not. Hey, hey, Paul, since we're on the subject of messaging, so I just <clears throat> want to clarify a couple things. At the Sheriff's Office, we're working closely with CAL FIRE on messaging. So as soon as that fire did cross Highway 29 um, on, the, on the west side of the freeway, we are already putting messaging out. So the Sheriff's Department is only in charge of Nixle. We're not in charge of the WIA or the IPAWS. Um, so obviously we learned a lot from 2017. We learned from the Kincaid fire last year. We've learned from the Wallbridge fire. So any feedback we get from the community members or uh, people, we take that into consideration and messaging. We could always improve. And that's the nice thing about the county is that we have different ways of contacting or communicating uh, to people contacting or getting the information out to the community. Uh, we understand it's not 100%. Uh, it's not always going to be 100%. And then also what we did with Nixle, it was geotargeting. We don't do any messaging. We're getting a lot of uh, calls that people live in the city of Santa Rosa that they were not getting our Nixles. We only message or Nixles are for the county only. City of Santa Rosa is in charge of doing the Nixles and messaging for within city limits. Uh, I know Paul Lowenthal and I were in constant communication that night of sending Nixles out, coordinating with Paul as well uh, to get people out of there, kind of where the fire is going and just kind of picking our brains back and forth, uh, bouncing ideas off of each other to get people out of harm's way. So, you know, it's next fire. Hopefully not. We're going to learn something, something as well. And it's one of those where it's constantly learning. We're trying to make things better, the communication better. Um, but it, it's, it's one of those. And I, we appreciate the, the feedback from the community as well. Yep. One other uh, point to bring up, but as uh, Sergeant Valencia is absolutely correct, there was actually a lot of methods uh, to the madness that were taking place that night and a lot of real detailed thought that were going in. And two things. Uh, one is, you know, the, there was a lot of discussion in the community about the use of channel drive and we would had reserve the right to reuse channel drive in the event that there was a fire coming from Annadale State Park. In this particular case, we the coordination went at all different levels from law enforcement, making sure they're in place at all the different signals uh, prior to a lot of those alerts going out and that the channel drive access was open. Uh, we've talked about uh, the use of emergency vehicle access points in our community. Um, and that truly showed uh, that a lot of the plans in place uh, do work and did work uh, very well. The targeting, uh, like Sergeant Valencia talked about, uh, was also very specific and coordinated between the various emergency management agencies uh, at the county in Santa Rosa. Um, we actually did get that night uh, complaints that people on the opposite side of town uh, over in whether it's the Coffee Park or west side of Santa Rosa, 
did not understand why they weren't getting the emergency alerts and felt they needed to get them. And we wanted to make it crystal clear that that was intentional and that we were only targeting residents specifically to the areas that we wanted to evacuate, knowing what the traffic would be like, purely targeting those specific areas. So uh, we definitely uh, wanted to make sure that the wireless emergency alerts were specific to the areas that we were focused on. We know there was a lot of confusion that was generated by a wireless emergency alert that was issued uh, by Napa. And that bleed over did hit uh, residents throughout Santa Rosa and uh, Sonoma County, uh, which uh, clearly did not help uh, with some of the confusion, but uh, we did issue uh, some nixels and some messaging here locally, uh, both I believe at the county level and the city level to help clarify that and make sure that we're restoring trust here locally in our use of the different various tools. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all. I, um, we certainly hope to get to the point where people understand that if they don't get an alert, that's good news. Um, but we're we're not quite there yet. We still have some work to do with the WIA system in particular that caused some of the, the most problems. Um, but um, we appreciate all your work on that. Um, we have, uh, I think, one final question, which has to do uh, more about the process of debris again. Um, and Crystal, I'm going to give this to you. Uh, Shane asks, he says, I went to the, the, the local assistance center at Creo, he said, but they didn't have the debris removal forms available. He's asking where and when might they be available? Do you have an answer for that? Um, I know that environmental health has a table there. And I did understand that that would be available. Lois, is that part of CPOD distribution or is that just? Um, I'm not quite sure what he means by debris removal forms. If it has to do with um, any kind of government sponsored program, again, that hasn't been approved. And so um, there are not forms available. Um, and as far as the phase one, there will be, there's not forms that are necessary to fill out. Again, that's mandatory and it will happen. Um, by the government on every parcel. So um, if anybody that has any questions about debris removal, um, they can contact Environmental Health, Sonoma County Environmental Health. Um, the phone number is 565-6700 or EH for Environmental Health, ehdebrisremoval.org. Um, so I encourage anyone with any questions about the debris removal to contact Environmental Health. Great. So um, that's, uh, uh, we're, we're coming near to the end of our time and I think we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, once again, I, I do wanna thank all of our panelists um, for being here tonight. And I also wanna thank all of our crew behind the scenes, um, including Ross, our producer, uh, Julie, our Spanish interpreter and Janice and Jennifer, our ASL interpreters. Um, we also thank our public information partners from the city of Santa Rosa and CAL FIRE for helping us in organizing this joint town hall meeting. We want to remind everyone that recordings of this briefing will be available on YouTube as well as on the county's Facebook page. Also, more information, as was mentioned tonight, more information about recovery and specifics of some of the things we've discussed are available on the socoemergency.org website, but the best uh, place to find information is to go to the Joint Local Assistance Center, which will be open daily for the next week through Wednesday, October 14th. As Supervisor Gorin mentioned earlier, tomorrow is the anniversary of the beginning of the October 2017 fires. In a recognition of, of uh, that, we sign off tonight in memory of all those who died during those, those, those fires, as well as in honor of all the firefighters who waged war against those flames and all the fires that we have experienced since. The hard work continues. And uh, we can't think of a better way to honor all of them and all that we continue to go through than with a little rain. We hope this one is substantial. With that, we wish you all a good night. Paul. Thank you, Paul.